Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> before I actually get started, I just want to take a few moments. Uh, first thing I want to let you all know, because I know many of you, you gave, uh, there was a need, of course, in Houston, Texas. We know we were recently hit with Hurricane Harvey, and a lot of you gave, uh, you may or may not have had it, but you still had a heart to give. And I don't know if you were aware, but we had to put some pictures here down below on this table. And this is basically what your money went to. Uh, there was actually families that lost their homes. Of course, many of you probably heard on the news and so on. And uh, our pastor, who was actually able to go there and open the church, and and uh, with a lot of resources that were given because of you know you here at New Life, uh, we were able to allow people to come in. We were able to have food. We and like God, you know how He does it. He brings abundance. He brings more than enough. So we we had so much we had to go and give it to other churches. You know what I'm saying? So thank you all for your, for your investment. Thank you all for giving and then being obedient to the voice of God. And, uh, you know, just one thing that was on my heart to all this, too, is, you know, who knows what, what God is going to do. Maybe this, I was telling, sharing with dad, my dad, uh, Gary here. Um, you know, maybe this is the beginning of a beautiful, righteous relationship between New Life and City on the Hill. And so with that also, I want to also thank Pastor Roger and Pastor Joy for this opportunity. I don't take it lightly to stand behind another man's pulpit. Uh, thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you for your love, and I know that you love your congregation here, so I know you don't take it lightly either as well. And, you know, thank God that you have a man of God who loves every one of you that, that lifts you up in church. And even beyond that, I just want to again thank all the leaders who are here in this church, and even those who minister behind the scenes. Uh, my wife and I, we do some things behind the scenes at our own church, and you know, and those things that go unseen, but you know, it's a blessing. That's how everything, we all come together as a body. We all make things operate so that when people come in, when visitors come, when, when the lost come in, that they feel welcome, they feel loved, and they feel the presence of God. And just So I want to thank all of you here as a, as a body. And uh, <clears throat> so with that being said, I'll just go ahead and I want to begin with an illustration this morning. You know, and with this illustration, if you can try to use your imagination a little bit, I want you to use your minds. And, Maybe some of you have to close your eyes, or maybe you can just kind of picture it yourself. But if you could picture with me two men walking through a, a heavy snowstorm, and I know that would be hard to imagine being here in Texas. We don't see snow often, except for maybe pictures. But if you could picture two men walking this morning through this heavy snowstorm, there's a, been a report that's gone out that uh, you know the snow is getting heavier and heavier and thicker and thicker. You know, a blizzard is on its way and it's coming. And so here they are, they're struggling, they're walking, and then they're going to a destination. They, they know where they're going. They know the way they've been that route. And, and these are men that have been great friends, you know, throughout their lives. And some of you can relate. You know, you've had those close friends in your life that are maybe even closer than a brother or closer than a sister. That you can almost know their mind and what they're thinking. You, you've been there. You've been through some things together. You've, you, you've shared some memories together. And so here's these men. They've had this past together. They've had this life together. They're walking through this storm and they, they're just trying to encourage each other. They're dressed in layers. They're, they're cold. They're shivering. They're freezing. And they're walking and they're pushing. And they know, like, we've got to get through this. We've got to go. There's a destination. We've got to reach safety. We've got to get there or we will be out here to die. So here they are. They're walking. Walking together, encouraging each other. They've gone at some distance. And again, they've walked, the, the snow is starting to heavy, fall heavier. You get to the place where you can almost barely vaguely see your hand in front of your face. Here they are, they're walking, and then all of a sudden they just, they trip and they stumble, and, but they notice what they stumble over is moving. It's, it's moving, so they're wondering what this could be. They, they begin to, to dig away a little bit at the snow, and they realize it's another man. So now here it is, they have a decision to make. So these men, they turn to each other, and one man says, look, this guy, he's, he's moving, he's still alive, he's breathing, he's not just left here for dead, he's, he's not lifeless, we've got to help him. And his friend, he turns to him and he tells him, look, I understand, you know, but look, if we don't keep going, if we don't get to our destination, we will be like this man. We will be the ones dying. We will be the ones out here in the snow left for dead. He's like, look, I, I'm sorry, I understand where you're coming from. But if we don't do something, it will be a burden in my heart and on my conscience that I can't live with if this man is left here to die. His friend says, she turns to him and says, look, you do what you want, but I'm going. I'm going to make it. I have a wife. I have a children. I have a family that needs me to make it. If you want to help him, you help him. But I've got to get back. I have loved ones I've got to get to. So he goes on without them. The other man, he, he helps this guy. He picks him up, puts him across his shoulders the best as he can. So now he's walking slower. 
You know, he's got this extra weight on him, this extra burden on him. He's carrying him, and he's going, and he's going, and you know, he's along the way, he's just encouraging him. Look, man, we're going to make it. Everything's going to be all right. We're going to get there. Don't worry. And here's this man just holding on with everything he's got, just being carried by this other man. You know, and who knows the thoughts going through his mind, and he's barely hanging on to life itself. And this man, you know, just encouraging him all along the way. Look, don't give up. Hang in there. We can do this. I'm in this with you. We can make it. Yes. And here they are. They're walking further. Their destination is in, within eyes reach. They can see it. And as they're walking, they stumble. These two men stumble as well. Only to look down and realize it's the dead body of his friend who left and didn't want to do something to make a difference in this man's life. Mm -hmm. You see, I, I want to minister on love this morning because I want you to know this, church, that when we get involved in the lives of other people, it helps us as well to keep carrying on. But when we are selfish, we will also be the man who will be left for dead. Amen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to minister on love this morning. The title of this message is Working From Love. Before I get into scripture, I want to let you know that I took the time to, to look at this word love. You know, and, uh, I looked at it in a few different areas because, you know, there's, there's something about even our own English language that a lot of us don't realize. And our own English language can change over time. You know, there's a thing called the law first mentioned that you can go back to the root of a word when it was first ever mentioned, and that's the actual root and the actual meaning of that word. So what I did is I went back all the way to the Webster's Dictionary in 1828. This is how far back I had to go. In the Webster's Dictionary in 1828, it says the word love is a verb. That means it's an action word. Right. Love is you do something. Amen. It's an action behind it. Yes. And what it actually says after that, it says it's prompt. Love is free, it's advancing. It means it's going somewhere. Can you say amen? Amen. So love is advancing or drawing forward. Now, the scripture I'm about to use here in a minute, it's in the New Testament, which is written in Greek. So what I did is I took this word love in the scripture, and I was like, okay, let me see what this means in the Greek, which is even before this 1828 Webster's Dictionary. So in the Greek, this is what it means. It means active. Again, here's that action word. Active love of God towards his son and his people. Amen. And the active love his people are supposed to have towards God, each other, and even our enemies. That's the hard part. Amen. But I'm telling you, this is, the, again, the Greek, the action word, love. It's an action. Now, I went a little further, and I looked this up in a more recent dictionary, but even in the 60s, 1969, in the Webster's Dictionary, this, this is how much this word love changes. It means affection, strong liking, attraction to the opposite sex. And that's it. That's what it means. You see, this, this is one thing about love. And you wonder why now, to, to, in today's society, you know, love is all about emotions and feelings and how you make me feel. If you make me feel good, I love you. Oh, but don't get on my nerves because I'm not going to love you anymore if you don't agree with what I'm doing or what I like. If you don't make me feel good, I don't love you. If you make me feel good, yes, I love you. But thank God that he's a God in heaven, that he loves us no matter what. I want to, I want to turn here where I get this, uh, where this message came from. If we couldn't turn in your, your Bible, if you have your Bible with you. It's in the book of Romans, chapter 5. I'll give you just a brief moment to turn there, but uh, let's go to Romans, chapter 5. Verse 8. And this here is basically the meat of this message. And while you're turning, I just want to let you know this. You know, uh, when I was given the invitation to, to do this, Amar was moved with compassion to, to come here to, to minister to you guys. You know, and my wife didn't know this either, but she had asked me, you know, as a, a few weeks or so, a day, a few days or a week or two after that, I, we gave, we got the invitation. She's like, uh, "Hey, has God given you a word to minister?" And I let her know, yes, he has. So, but what if he changes it when you get there? She didn't know this, but God actually changed it whenever I, we were still there. See, I had, a, I had several messages written down. I was sharing this with Pastor uh, Roger and, and my dad earlier. Uh, I wanted to minister on faith. I had several written down in the past, and God gave me a completely different message, which I'll bring it to you today. I wrestled with it. I was like, God, but that man, there's one on faith. God, you know, you're sure going to do this with God. It's really good. But of course, you know, God went. So, so if we could turn here to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. We're going to see some action here this morning. All right. See, it says here in uh, Romans ch chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
The only thing I want to look at right there is God demonstrates. Yeah. That's the action right there. You see, in, again right here it says while we were still sinners. So what does this mean? So those of you who may not know already. This means while we were lost in the world. When we didn't know Jesus. When we didn't know God. We had our preconceived ideas of who we thought God was. That we were lost. You know, myself, I can tell you, I was someone who was chasing the world. I believed there was a God. But here I was lost. You know, I've seen some religion. I've seen things on television. I've seen things on movies. And I began to think, God, this is who I believe you to be. I believe, God, that as long as I just do some good things here and there, as long as I acknowledge you and I show up to a church service maybe once a month, once a year, or whatever it may be, and that I can still smoke cigarettes, or I can still drink my alcohol, or I can still do the drugs, or I can still chase the women, or I can still party. As long as I acknowledge you, God, right? Isn't this okay, God? You see, this is our preconceived ideas. You know, this, is, this was us in the world. Many of you can relate to. This was us lost in the world. We didn't know God, but see, the thing about it is God had that unconditional love. You know, you hear in the world, if you tell someone, you can go up to a stranger today and tell them, look, Jesus loves you. When you turn to him. When you turn to him. And a lot of times you hear the words, I'm not ready. And the truth is, we weren't. I wasn't ready. Many of you here can testify you weren't ready. But you see, thank God in heaven that he said, you know you're not ready, but I'm going to die for you anyways because I love you. And that is true love. You know, so this morning looking at love again, we have to ask ourselves, we have to examine ourselves. Is our love towards God based on our feelings and our emotions? Do we only live for God when things are going good, when we're getting blessed, when we're on top of the mountain? You know, is our love with God based on our feelings and emotions? Or does our love actively draw us towards God? Does it make us want to do something for Him? Does it make us, we're not here, we can't earn His love. Like I said, we read here in Romans, He loved us anyways. He loved us, we weren't ready. We didn't deserve Jesus to die for us. We all deserve hell if we can be honest this morning. I know I deserve it, though. And, uh, but thank God, again, like I said, He loves us, that he, he died for us anyways. And so God's love draws Him towards us even when we don't deserve it. And with this being said, I want you to turn with me, please, now. We have a few scriptures to turn to this morning. <laughs> but I just want you guys, I want everyone to really get a hold of what God wants, what God wants to do in us. Amen. If you could turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10, Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 2 this morning. Uh, and, and for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and read it. If you turn there, praise God. If not, you can write it down and you can read it later. But Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 through 19. Which does, please give your ear and pay attention to this one. It says here, 10, 17 through 19. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He ministers justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Right there we see action. Therefore love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So basically, we see here, this is the children of Israel, this is after they've been delivered. God began to move upon them. And you know, Egypt a lot of times we know is a picture of the world. And as I was just speaking a minute ago, you know, we were all lost. The Bible, the Word of God says... We've all sinned and all short of the glory of God. We've all, last I checked, I, I was born a sinner. I wasn't born a Christian. Amen. You know, and I want you to know this morning that uh, we were all strangers. We were all lost. We were all in the world. We all had our own battles. We all had our own things, you know, but we didn't have to be taught to sin. It was the, the desires of the flesh. It was the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You know, these are the things in our own heart. We were all strangers. We were all strangers like the ones in Egypt. And speaking of the stranger this morning, I want to share with you a testimony this morning. You see, I remember when I was 19 years old when I first came to know Jesus Christ. And yes, I had my times in my life where yes, I fell away and I, I came back. You know, thank God. And this time, it's, 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 it's on. Amen. Hell, it, you'll, you'll see in a minute there's more. But I want you to know this this morning. You know, 19 years old, I got saved, gave my life to Jesus. At that time, I, I believe I may have been the only person in my family who was living for God at that time. This was 20 years ago. And you know, I began to pray for my family. God, if you could just touch my family, Lord. And I remember specifically my own mother. I began to lift her up before God. 
day in and day out, I would cry to God, God, if you could just save my mother. You see, I don't want to tell my, my mother's dirt, but thank God she's saved. But I want to tell you, we've done some sins together. You know, we, we were lost. You know, there was drugs, there was alcohol. I have family members, you know, that's what sinners do, right? We sin. You know, I, I, when I came to life to Jesus, I began to trip. God, if you could just save my mother, God. If you could just touch her, God. Days would go by, weeks would go by. She would visit the church I was attending back then at those times. She would attend and I, my heart would be leaped with joy. Oh yes, God, she's going to get it today, God. She would go back and still live the same life. I would pray more, God, please just save her, God. Touch her, God. Months would go by. A year went by. Another six months went by. Two years praying for my mother. God spoke to me one day and I want you to know this. This is what God wants to speak to you this morning. God told me, he said, look, if you can love the stranger like you love your mother, this is the word you draw on right here. If you could love the stranger, you see, he said, if you could love the stranger like you love her, then I can save your mother. I said, God, what do you mean if I could love the stranger, God? What do you mean, God? I don't get it, God. He said, she means something to you, doesn't she? He said, if, she, if I was to take her life and she doesn't know me, she would spend an eternity in hell. How would you feel, son, knowing that your mother could live in hell forever? How would you feel if I took her life right now? Devastation began to set in my heart. I began to picture my life. I began to picture the feelings and the emotions that I would feel in my own heart if my mother had been taken, knowing the truth finally for the first time in my life. And I began to say, God, forgive me, God. Help me to love the stranger, God. How do you see the stranger, God? How does it feel in your heart, God, when you look into the eyes of the stranger, into the eyes of the lost? How does your heart feel, Lord God? And he began to mend my heart with his heart. And I want you to know this this morning. Because every single one of you here sitting right here today, you have someone dear to you in your heart. That you can even close your eyes or you can think to yourself right now. It could be a mother. It could be a father. It could be a sister. It could be a brother, aunt, uncle. There's someone close to everyone's heart. And if you could be honest with yourself, if they were to pass away right now, it would break your heart. You would be devastated. I want you to picture that with me right now because listen, you've been praying for your loved ones. You've been praying for the family members. You have been taking their name before God. And this is what God gave me to tell you today. If you will love the stranger and you will work through love and if you will go out there and labor and love and win the loss and labor and love the stranger all the way into the house of God, then you will save that very person that you've been praying for this morning. And that is what God says this morning. Give God praise to you. So that is a challenge to you all this morning that God wants me to tell you this morning. That is a challenge. Do the word. Go out. Bring them in. Bring in the stranger. See, love should stir our hearts to do something. Love should stir us to do something, to make a difference. How many of you here this morning, you remember? A lot of, a lot of couples here this morning, you remember when you first fell in love with each other. Especially, especially men, if I can be honest this morning. Hopefully it was the man chasing the woman, amen? <laughs> so, well, see, I, so imagine with me this morning, you know, picture, remember those days when you chased the woman that you love. You wanted to romance her. Maybe it was another man chasing her at the same time. You're like, man, I got to outwit this guy. I want, I want her. So you did everything you, do, you could do to romance her, to date her. You pursued her. You did something this morning. Your love, you wanted to make something, and you wanted to make a difference, and you want her. She's here with you this morning. You see, I want you to know this today. That's the way that God pursues you. Amen. You can go out there in the world. You can do what you want. You can live the life you want. But God's always there calling you. Yes. There's been times in your life when you were alone. Times that you felt broken. You felt empty inside. You feel like no one understood you. You felt this heavy burden and this pressure of the world. And the whole time, those times you can think in your own life that you can hear a whisper. Come. Just come. That's the voice of God this morning. And I want you to know also, that's the same love and the same way that God wants us to pursue His children and the ones that are lost, the stranger this morning. So let's look at what it is to do something this morning in the Word of God. If you could turn with me to the book of James, chapter 1, verse 22. And again, if, if, you, if you're not there, it's okay. You can write it down. A lot of you here, you know the scriptures. 
James chapter 1, 22 through 25. And this was confirmed this morning when Dad and I were talking this morning. And I mean, he was just telling me things over and over like, Dad, that's in the message this morning. He said something else, Dad, that's also in the message this morning. I love the way God confirms his word. Amen. Um, so uh, looking here in James chapter 22, verse 2 through 25. Again, if, if you don't have your Bible, it's okay. If you're not there, it's okay. You can write it down. But the main thing, like I said, give ear and, and listen this morning. There's, something that, there's some things here that's really going to stand out to us. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing himself. I'm sorry, observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. Amen. Amen. You see, so we begin to look at this word, you know, and being a hearer and a doer. And again, it says if we hear only, we deceive ourselves. I've been there. I've lived it. Going more into it, it says here, it's like a man seeing himself in the mirror and immediately forgets what he looks like. So this is an image this morning that basically you, you could picture a man. He's, he's getting ready to go somewhere. He's looking in the mirror, making sure he's sharp. You know, making sure his beard is edged up right. Making sure his haircut looks good. You know, he's getting all fresh, getting dressed. He's looking, he's about to go out the door. Oh, wait, he's got to go right back. Man, hold on, I missed something. I missed something here. Get your straight there. And then again, he's going back. He's ready to go out. He's going, oh, hold on. Let me just, I got to see again. I got to check again. You see, this is the image of how we can be in the world when we only hear the word of God and we do nothing about it. Yeah. We know we can be doers of praying. We know we can be doers of reading the word. We know we can do these things, but can you be a doer to go out into the streets? Like it says, the Great Commission. Go out into the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. Teach them to pray for the sick, to cast out devils. In Jesus' name. But this is the doer. We know the Great Commission, but are we doing the Great Commission? This is the question from God this morning. I promise you this did not come for me this morning. I pray even right now that I would get out of the way, God, that you would take over. God, I pray this morning right now that you have your way, God. Let your Holy Spirit lead, God, and not me, Lord God. You know I'm not here on my agenda, God, but I'm here to do what you would say, Lord. And listen to me this morning. God wants to challenge us. He's not here to push you. He's not here to force you. He's a gentleman, and he loves. He loves you. He loves us. But listen to me this morning. There's times in my life I don't feel like doing some things. But you know when I don't feel like doing some things, I deceive myself because I'm only hearing. When I come to church and I begin to soak and receive and receive, I hear it, I hear it, I read it, I read it, I learn, I receive. I'm like a sponge that's getting larger and larger, but there's no outflow, there's no outflow. But I want to let you know this morning that Jesus, he didn't save us this way. He saved us. We're broken vessels. We're torn apart. We're broken. We're empty. He begins to clean us. He begins to repair us. He begins to reshape us and remold us. Then his Holy Spirit comes in and fills us. But not only does he want to fill you. That you just receive, receive. There's an overflow. That those vessels out there that are broken. Those vessels out there that are dirty. That are muck and mired and poor up. And that, that look disgusting for the eye. And are not pleasing. You might look at someone like, man, I don't know if I want to talk to that brother. I don't know if I want to talk to that sister. But the voice of God says, go and love on them. And bring them in. And you can know the life of the living God. In Jesus' name. You see, I know... Uh, here this morning, I'm going to share this with you, you know. Going back to the scripture, James, that we just read. Many of you know again about the hurricane. My wife and I, you know, Temple, like I grew up in Temple, Texas. My wife, she grew up uh, near a little past Dallas. So we only lived in the Houston area since 2009. We actually moved into Houston in June this year. So this hurricane's coming, you know, we're not knowing what to expect. There's flood zones, you know, we don't know what areas do flood and don't flood. Like, man, you know, we live in a second story apartment. So we're like, you know what, our apartment will be fine, our vehicles, you know, they're little cars, we'll just come here, we'll visit family, you know, and just see what God does. And so, you know, we came and so on, and of course, you know, you know, we came to visit while we were here. And while I was here, though, God began to stir my heart. You know, he began to stir my heart because he showed me something. He said, look, this devastation is coming, but I'm preparing hearts. There's people who are broken, there's people who are lost. They've been living their life the way that they want. But, you know, he was showing me that he's preparing the harvest field. And began to put a heaviness on my heart that I couldn't wait. I was itching inside. I've got to go back. 
I've got to make a difference. I've got to tell people Jesus is the way. I've got to give them Jesus is the answer. I don't have the answer, but because I have Jesus, now I have an answer. And I'm telling you this right now. I, my wife and I, when we were here, I would come here early in the morning with my, with my dad. And uh, I was allowed to go here in Pastor Joy's office and in Pastor Roger's office. And I just began to pray and I began to labor in prayer for these people there in Houston. God, please give me something to go back with, God. Give me a message for the lost, Lord. Give me something to say, God. I, no one knows I was going to do this. No one but my wife and my children. They partnered together with me. We go there to Houston. And I'm sharing this with you because I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what you do. God will, God will meet you if you just step out. Amen. If you just go to do something, He will do make up where we laugh. My wife and my children, we just got a bunch of hot dogs, threw them on the grill, snapped them together, went out to the middle of our apartment complex. And I want to share this with you right quick too, and I will continue on right here. We pray for where we live at now. Houston, Texas is the fourth largest city in the U.S. Not every area of Houston is a bad area. Amen. We see a lot of things through rap music and videos and different things of killings and shootings. Well, I want you to know we actually live in that area. <laughs> the area that my wife and my kids and I live in is called Greens Point. We didn't know this. I just found this out about a few weeks ago. It's Greens Point. But the, the, the term for where we live, they call it Guns Point. We had a SWAT team come to our apartments just a few weeks ago. Busting in someone's door. We had a young woman and her children get attacked walking from Walmart, walking to their apartment, which we live right behind the Walmart. I said, there's crime, there's high things that are going on. But I pray and I ask God before we move there, God, where do you want me to go where there's a people who are lost? God, where do you want me to go where there are people who are hurting? Because I don't know, I don't care where I go, God, as long as I'm in your will and in your plan, I can walk through the pits of hell and fear. Because God is good. We just prepared hot dogs, we drew a crowd, we got a bullhorn, and then we begin to announce free hot dogs, free waters, come receive, come, come, everyone come, children bring your parents, come. And then I'm here we were praying, looking at my wife and my children just serving with the heart to serve. A crowd began to form and I'll ask God, when do you want me to say to God? Lord, what do you want me to say and when do I say to God? And the moment the crowd came, we just began to preach love, preach Jesus. And I want to tell you that our people now going to the church there in City on the Hill because God touched them, because God saved them, because we were willing to do something this morning in Jesus' name and name. Listen and listen to me this morning, church. Everything I'm telling you, this is this is the love from my heart. You know, and this is more than that, the love of God. Again, we don't do this to earn anything. It's because, God, I love you and you're more than enough. God, you saved me from the pits of hell, the grasp of hell. I've had my ups and my downs. I was like the man in the mirror. You know, I would go back and forth between God and the world, between God and the world, and then finally enough was enough. And God is the love, God, that I'm so thankful that I just want to make a difference in someone else's life, that when I look into the eyes of the lost, my heart gets broken. I don't know anything about the stranger, but my heart gets broken and gets moved with compassion because Jesus is alive inside. I have to do something. I can't sit still. If I sit still and I do nothing, I can't sleep at night. I will toss and turn in my bed. God, God, I've got to do something, Lord. And I want you to know this morning, that is the love of God. We work from love. If you have the love of God in you, it's not to earn Him. It's not to earn love. You can't earn anything from God. He gives grace freely. Salvation is a gift. But the love should drive you to do something. You shouldn't be able to look upon the lost. Not look at them with disgust or to judge. We should look at them with love. Amen. Don't forget where you came from this morning. Amen. If we could turn to Matthew chapter 26, we're going to look at Jesus this morning. What are, what the best role model this morning, Jesus. I can testify what God has done through me, but let's look at what Jesus did himself, God in the flesh. Amen. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, verse 39 to 40. You know, I want you to know we're about to read this, and God showed me something here about Jesus. And it was powerful and blew my mind. I was sharing with my wife this morning. I didn't go into detail with my wife. She, she doesn't know if you can anything about this. She's hearing it for the first time, too. But, you know, God showed me something. I'm like, man, God is power. Your word is amazing. Kind of like our brother James was sharing this morning. It's like right there, and that light comes on sometimes. Like, man, it's right there, and it's so simple, but sometimes we just don't catch it. Right here in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39 through 40, this is Jesus praying. Before I read it real quick, I want to just paint a picture for you. This is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
And I know many of you here, you know this, what's, what's happening here. But for those of you who don't, I just want to break it down a little bit. This is Jesus praying in the garden. This is before he's getting ready to go die on the cross for you and for me. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. Of course, Jesus, he knows what's already about to take place. He knows why he came to earth. He came to die for our sins. Here he is in the garden. And he begins to pray. The, the, the word that we're about to read in a minute, he distances himself from his disciples. He basically told the disciples, hey, look, you guys, hey, look, thank you guys. Y'all stay right here. You guys, y'all pray. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to step away for a little bit. I, I need some personal time with me and the Father. So he walks away a little ways. He's going. And he just begins to fall flat on his face. He begins to cry out to God. And the Bible says that he begins to sweat drops of blood. You know, I used to understand. I used to like, think, like, how is this possible? Sweat drops of blood. If you actually look it up scientifically and you go to a doctor, they will tell you, you can literally be so stressed out, so stressed out, that you can begin to have blood sweat out through your pores. Now, I've been stressed out sometimes in my life, but I've never been that stressed. And I'm sure many of you women can say amen. Y'all probably experience some stress, especially from those knucklehead husbands, right? <laughs> I want you to know that I'm sure none of you have been that, that stressed when you had drops of blood coming out through your pores. So this tells me Jesus, God in the flesh, he was going through something. This was an agonizing moment in his life he's about to face. He's going through something here. So picture this with me. Here he is, stressed out. We, we can't fathom or comprehend this because we've never experienced this. Here he is in the garden. The blood pouring, coming out of his pores, sweating out of his pores. He's praying right here in verse 39. Matthew 26, 39 through 40. It says, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then right here in verse 40, it says, Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? What did, what did I saw in this? You notice there the word, he came in an hour. So this tells me, see, we, we, we read that one part. He came and he said, Father, if it's we will take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done. And right there, we begin to think this was his prayer, you know, a simple prayer. Oh, God, if, it's, if there's any other way, God, take this cup from me, you know, and nevertheless, not my will, not your will, God, thank you, amen. You know, that's the way we kind of read it sometimes. But see, it says he was there for an hour. I don't think Jesus was there for an hour praying a repetitious prayer. I don't think he was there for an hour sweating blood saying, Father, if it's your, you know, I don't want to do this, God, if it's your will, you know. I don't think that was the prayer. I think his prayer was more intense, church. Amen. I think Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, he, he was all God, but he was all man at the same time. Amen. I believe the flesh in him, he knew it was about to take place. I believe, that, I believe that prayer was a little bit more intense for him to be that stressed out that he was sweating blood through his pores. Me personally, I believe that that prayer was along the lines of, God, I don't want to do this, God. If there's another way, please make another way. Why do I have to go and feel that kind of a pain? Can I just do something, cut my finger, one drop of blood will be enough for them, God. Can I just prick my finger and let that fall and hit the ground, God? God, I don't want to do this. They're going to whip me. The flesh is going to be torn. Muscles be ripped from my back. Oh, and then i got to carry this cross, this agonizing pain that I'm already going to face and suffer. Blood pushing out. I'm going to be dying out before I even reach the mountain, God. I don't want to do this. I can imagine the pain. Oh, that
we're going to jump right there. Same chapter. Let's get down to verse 42. This is Jesus. If you remember way back we read earlier this morning about loving your enemies. It says, again, the second time he went away and prayed, saying, oh, my God, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. You see, this took him, that love took him all the way to that cross for all of us. That love took him to the cross. That even when he stood on that cross, naked in humiliation, body shredded to pieces for the beatings he had already suffered. And all he could hear, he hears there's a thief on his left and on his right. And one of them begin to mock him. Begin to shame him. Oh, if you're God, just take yourself from this cross. He began to hear the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders of Crucify him. He is not our king. He is not our Messiah. Crucify him. And he looked into the very eyes of those religious leaders, the enemies of God, who he still loved and he still died for. And he looked into their eyes. Every breath that he had on that cross, Dad and I were sharing this morning, every breath that he had on that cross, just to lift himself up to speak, was taking the breath out of his lungs. And he still spoke out. He looked at those religious leaders saying, crucify him, kill him, do away with him. He pushed himself up, gasping for breath to say, forgive them, Father. Look in their eyes, forgive them, Father. And that's the same love that he has for you, for you, for me this morning. <laughs> Listen. My prayer this morning, church, is this. That love of God be inside of every one of our hearts. That when you're driving down the road and you look and you see someone lost, you see that you can be sensitive to the voice of God and to the Holy Spirit living inside of you. That you can't sit still, but you I've got to do something, God. I've got to tell them, Lord. Listen, you might not know the words to speak, but if you just go in love, Amen. love will conquer a multitude of sin. Just love them. Invite them. God will be the rest in you. If I could this morning have every head bowed, every eye closed in this place, in respect to God and respect to your name. I want to thank you all this morning. You know that some of you here, you may not have understood everything that was taking place or said. Right now in your mind, you might be thinking, you know, sir, this was these are little messages here, but I really don't understand this about God. I don't really know what God wants from me. I don't know who God is. And I want you to know this morning that's okay. Because God knows who you are this morning. Amen. He loves you enough that He died from the cross that He looked even to today. He looked into your tomorrow. And He says, listen, son. Listen, daughter, I love you. Not only do I love you, I have something great for you. You chased the world. You've seen, you've tasted it. You've seen where the world takes you. You've seen what it offers you. Times you woke up in, your, in the middle of the night with regret, with sorrow, with the pain you felt in your heart. But Jesus says, no more do you have to have those feelings. I will take them from you. Some of you here, you grew up not knowing your father. God is a good father. We sung this song this morning. He's a good, good father. Amen. He will love you more than you could ever experience. He will love you on your good days and he'll love you even on your bad days. Amen. And I want you to know you can know this father this morning. He accepts you just the way you are. He loves you just the way you are. All of your failures, all of your shortcomings, all of the mistakes you made in your life. We saw right here. He demonstrated his love that even though you were doing wrong, he still died for you because he loves you. Even if you were to look at him today and spit in his face, he would look into your eyes and say, God, forgive them. I still love them. I still died for them. And he's telling you right now, when you come, when you come, if that's you right now, no one is looking around. This is personal between you and the living God. If that's you this morning, just simply raise your hand up and say, God, I don't have no other feeling, but I need you, Lord. You right now, amen. I see that hand, amen. And will there be any other? Just between you and God, I see that hand, amen. Jesus loves you just who you are. If there's anyone else, just honest hearts between you and God, you don't have to look up. You can keep your head down, your eyes closed. Anyone else in this place, maybe you say, you know, God, I do know you, God. But I haven't really been a doer, God. I didn't know what it was to be a doer, Lord. I want to be a doer, Lord, God. I want to feel that love and that compassion that you felt when you looked into my life and saved me from my mess. God, that I can be someone else who can go out and just love others the way that you love me, God. If that's you this morning, just raise your hand. Amen. Amen. I see those hands. Hands all across this place. It's between you and God this morning. 
Amen. We're going to pray together. And those of you who lifted your hands, and if we could just all pray together, not to single anyone out. If you want to pray with me this morning, just repeat after me. Say, Father God, Father God I come to you this morning, you this morning through the precious blood of Jesus. And God, I ask you this morning that you would come into my heart for I have acknowledged that I am a sinner, Lord. God, I know that I don't have it all together. But God, where I lack, you can come in and take me forward, God. And I surrender this morning. Please come into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. And help me, God, that I don't just hear your word, but I do your word. Make it personal, God, between you and me. In Jesus' name.